Thank you for coming to Research in Progress. We have uh, two speakers today. Um, Erin Zinkhan, who's a fellow in the Division of Pediatric Neonatologists, and she's going to discuss IUGR effects on cholesterol homeostasis. And then Josh Monkowski, who's an assistant professor in the Division of Pediatric Neurology. Are you associate, though? Uh, no. We hope so soon. I think you are. <laughs> so, wait, wait, you got Thanks for bringing it up. <laughs> Sorry. I thought you were. Uh, Utah Advanced Pediatric Therapeutics Translating Science into Cures. It's going to be our second topic conversation. So, thank you. Thanks. So, I have nothing to disclose. And please feel free to tell me if you cannot hear me or if you need me to slow down or if I'm going too slowly. Um, so the whole um, background behind why I'm interested in uh, cholesterol metabolism is because, well, we don't think about it necessarily a whole lot in pediatrics. Certainly our adult colleagues think about it regularly. Cholesterol is one of the big risk factors for developing cardiovascular disease, and it's a very um, strong predictor uh, of and leading cause of mortality um, in the um, adults. We also know that cholesterol levels, um, as they're increasing, the risk of having a cardiovascular event um, increases in a graded fashion, such that the higher your cholesterol, the greater your risk for um, having a cardiovascular event. Um, concurrently with that, as you are lowering, lowering your cholesterol levels, the lower your cholesterol becomes to a certain point, um, the lower your risk of um, a cardiovascular event. So therefore, it behooves us to know what are um, other predictors and what are other associations with developing hypercholesterolemia that we can deal with in the pediatric time and that affect us as pediatricians. One of those is intrauterine growth restriction, or IUGR, which um, in epidemiologic studies has been shown to increase the risk of developing um, hypercholesterolemia, as well as the other um, components of the metabolic syndrome, including fatty liver disease. Now, while it is an increased risk, it certainly does not happen to every IUGR individual. And it can be difficult to determine which IUGR individuals are actually at risk for developing hypercholesterolemia. And because we always have a risk to our screening, to our treatment, to our prevention measures, um, it's important to know the mechanisms behind why and how IUGR is causing um, these increased risks, and therefore who to intervene and who to treat. We know that the etiology of IUGR plays a significant role in developing both hypercholesterolemia and fatty liver. Um, such that in epidemiologic studies, um, uh, people born at high elevations, um, so are exposed to hypoxia, um, as well as during um, famine, um, have a much higher risk of developing hypercholesterolemia um, than other etiologies of IUGR. There's mixed data right now on whether utero placental insufficiency, or UPI, leads to hypercholesterolemia. Um, and that's a critical factor because UPI is a leading cause of IUGR in developed uh, nations such as our own, where food is abundant and we generally don't live above 10,000 feet. IUGR and diet certainly have an interactive role. IUGR individual, individuals do seem to be more vulnerable to the effects of a typical Western diet, um, when it's high in fat, high in cholesterol, as I know many of you are enjoying the cookies in the back, um, common um, in the developing world. And we're going to call the high-fat diet <coughs> just HFD for the remainder of um, these slides. It is unknown, however, what the mechanism through which IUGR increases the vulnerability of IUGR individuals to the effects of a high-fat diet. So therefore, I've developed a couple of hypotheses. The central hypothesis is that UPI-induced IUGR will alter an individual's response to high-fat diet consumption. More specifically, that UPI-induced IUGR will increase cholesterol in offspring whose mothers consumed a high-fat diet. Do you know many of our mothers, as much as they may try, still end up consuming a typical American diet, so it's still relatively high in fat and cholesterol. And secondly, that UPI-induced IUGR alters the regulation of genes involved in cholesterol metabolism. So we're going to look at um, the results for the first hypothesis today, and we're going to get a glimpse at the second hypothesis, and then I'm going to talk about what we're actually going to do with that. So in order to um, start chipping away at these hypotheses, um, I've had to start my own rat model. Um, you've heard some of um, the stuff about the new diet um, in our lab from last year's RIP. Um, 
we've now started this with a prenatal diet. So these rats are either on the regular rat chow or on a high fat diet for five weeks prior to conception um, and throughout gestation. The rats then, um, half of them undergo uterine artery ligation to produce IUGR rats. And then we harvest the rat pups at birth um, by a cesarean section. And because this is a new model, um, we've had to characterize the maternal and neonatal phenotypes of um, these rats so that we can then actually understand the system that we're working in before we can actually start getting down to a mechanism. So all of these data are going to be, um, or the following data are going to be shown as follows. So the regulars, the moms who are on the regular diet, regular plus IUGR is the regular diet, and then these moms themselves undergo the IUGR surgery for their pups. A high-fat diet, and then the high-fat diet plus the IUGR surgery. When we look at their pre-pregnancy weight, there's no difference between these groups um, in their pre-pregnancy weight. But the high-fat diet uh, consuming moms ended up gaining more weight um, by term gestation. Um, so their weight at term was higher and then their weight gain was also higher for, um, for this group. And that occurred despite having the same number of pups per litter um, compared to any of the other uh, control groups. We fast these rats at the time of cesarean section. They're fasted for six to eight hours prior to delivery. And their fasting glucoses are also unchanged at the time um, of the cesarean section. Now having said that, their serum non-HDL cholesterol, non-HDL cholesterol is the sum of low density lipoprotein and very low density lipoprotein cholesterol. Their serum is too viscous to actually differentiate between LDL and VLDL. It looks kind of like cheese coming out of these rats. So, um, we, <clears throat> as a substitute, we looked at the non-HDL cholesterol, so the sum of the bad cholesterol, essentially. Um, there's two points to take away from this particular set of data. One, the typical rat has lower non-HDL cholesterol than typical humans, which run around 100. Um, the second is that their non-HDL cholesterol is extremely high um, when they consume this typical Western diet. And lastly, um, that those who undergo the IUGR surgery um, have lower cholesterol than those who do not when they both consume the high-fat diet. Now we're going to look at the neonatal rat characteristics um, before we go into the, um, the actual data, um, the research data for me to show. Um, so for these neonatal rats, um, the control regular group is the pups for moms who ate the regular diet who did not undergo IUGR surgery. IUGR regular is moms who consumed regular diet who did not go under GR surgery and who went, underwent the IUGR surgery. So these pups themselves are growth restricted. Similarly, mother consumed the high fat diet, um, non IUGR, and then mother consumed the high fat diet and IUGR. And the males are represented along the top row and the females are along the bottom row. And looking at their weight at the time of delivery um, in this set of animals, um, the IUGR rats, whose mothers consumed a regular diet, were between 24 and 28 percent growth restricted. This is what we have seen in our rat model um, uh, over years of experience. So this is consistent with that. Uh, the mothers who consumed a high-fat diet, um, those pups had were 11 to 14 percent growth restricted. <coughs> Excuse me. It only reached statistical significance in the females. And then the um, pups who are IUGR and whose mothers consumed a high-fat diet were between 26 and 30 percent growth restricted. We also looked at the fasting glucoses for the um, neonatal rat pup, and uh, the only difference we found was actually an increase in fasting. Well, the mother was fasting, um, an increase in the glucose in the females whose mothers um, underwent IUGR surgery. So next to the actual data. Um, which is the whole point of doing this entire model, um, looking at the neonatal rat serum non-HDL cholesterol. And all of this data for the next several slides are going to be presented in a similar fashion. So we'll have our males will be on the left side of the screen and the females on the right side. The controls will be represented by C and the IUGR by an I, and then the regular and the high-fat diet. Below that, all of the data are represented as a percent of the sex-matched regular diet control. Um, for the male and the female, and that's normalized to 100%, also as represented by the dashed line. So IUGR in and of itself on a regular diet did not increase serum non-HDL cholesterol. 
Interestingly, neither did the high-fat diet um, increase the serum cholesterol for the pups. And sadly for me, neither did that happen in the IUGRs. But I didn't stop. I looked at their liver cholesterol. So liver cholesterol is a component of um, developing fatty liver, and it's also important because the liver is the site of regulation of the genes that control cholesterol metabolism. IUGR by itself didn't increase hepatic cholesterol. The high-fat diet um, by itself did not increase hepatic cholesterol, but the um, combination of maternal high-fat diet and being IUGR increased your hepatic cholesterol for females. It looks like it's increased in the males. The p-value is about 0.07. So we never achieved statistical significance for that um, set of rats. And that is statistically significant both compared to your regular diet control as well as compared to the high-fat diet control. So this is an increase compared to both of our control groups. So just a brief summary of the model itself. Um, so maternal um, high-fat diet increased maternal weight gain and increased maternal non-HDL cholesterol. But when you add on top of that the IUGR surgery, you actually have lower maternal non-HDL cholesterol, unchanged neonatal rat pup cholesterol, but increased hepatic cholesterol. And so that leads to the question of where did that cholesterol come from? Um, and so this is a great opportunity then to actually look at the genes that are involved um, in cholesterol regulation. And there's a handful of them that we're going to look at today. Um, the first is the sterile sensitive element binding proteins, um, or SRUBPs. There's two that we are going to look at more carefully. That's 1A and 2, and I'll talk a little bit more about what they do. HMG QA reductase and the low density lipoprotein receptor. So SRUBP 1A and 2 both, um, independently, just because I didn't think you wanted to see this twice, I didn't put two separate proteins on here. But they can both bind to their sterile response element, or SRE, on the low-density lipoprotein receptor, producing the LDL receptor, which is moved to the cell membrane, binds to serum cholesterol, and internalizes it. Similarly, SREBPs can bind to HMG QA reductase, it's the rate-limiting step of de novo cholesterol synthesis. And then in turn, high hepatic cholesterol levels end up um, decreasing SREBP, mRNA, and protein, so both transcription and post-translational modifications. SRABP1 uh, contains two um, alternative transcription start sites, and it produces two distinct proteins with distinct functions. SRABP1A um, is a transcription factor for both cholesterol and lipid metabolism, whereas 1C, which is slightly shorter, um, only um, is involved in lipid metabolism and is not involved in cholesterol metabolism, and so we're not going to talk about that further at this point. SRABP2 has no known splice variants, uh, to date, um, but it is a transcription factor for um, cholesterol metabolism almost exclusively. And so we're going to look at um, mRNA levels of those um, particular genes, um, starting with srabp one a um, initially. So IUGI didn't decrease um, srabp one a didn't alter, um, I'm sorry, high-fat diet didn't um, alter srabp one a but um, SRBP1A was decreased in males and females um, in the IUGR high-fat diet group. And in the females, that was also significant compared to the high-fat diet control. SRABP2, um, similarly, um, was decreased by IUGR only in males, decreased by the high-fat diet, again, only in males, decreased by IUGR in the male and the female in combination with the high-fat diet, and for both was significant compared to um, the high-fat diet control. And so we have a system now where we have increased hepatic cholesterol in the pups, and we have altered rate for altered mRNA levels of um, two big transcription factors that control downstream targets. And so then we looked at the downstream targets, HMG clay reductase and the LDL receptor. So first, HMG clay reductase, which was not changed by IUGR, actually increased by the high-fat diet, and um, compared to the high-fat diet, decreased by the combination of IUGR and the high-fat diet. And then lastly, the LDL receptor, not changed by IUGR, not changed by the high-fat diet alone, and decreased in the males um, who are IUGR and whose mothers consumed a high-fat diet. So what we've, um, we were able to conclude from this is that UPI-induced IUGR Increased hepatic cholesterol, 
and decreased SRADP1A into mRNA levels in a sex-specific manner, and to a lesser extent, um, did alter downstream targets, HMG clear reductase and the LDL receptor, at least for the mRNA levels. This happened only in combination with high-fat diet consumption in the moms. The future directions are going to be really to look at um, the mechanism of increased hepatic cholesterol. So all I've shown you today has been just the mRNA levels. Um, we want to be looking upstream of that. Um, uh, the factors controlling SRBDP1A and 2 synthesis. Um, one of those big factors is going to be um, PPAR gamma, which is one of the transcription factors for um, the SRBDPs, and has additional advantage of um, being able to uh, manipulate um, SRBDP1A and 2 synthesis via pharmacologically relevant factors. So PPAR gamma and the SRBDPs, to a lesser extent, respond to um, the fatty acid environment. So if you have a high saturated fatty acid environment, both of those genes um, are decreased in their, um, in their activity and their function, whereas um, uh, anti-inflammatory omega-3 um, environment uh, increases um, those um, proteins. We're also going to be looking at the transcription um, a little bit more closely in um, the SRBP1 a and 2 genes um, and look at the epigenetic marks along the lengths of these genes. We're going to be looking around the promoter for SRADP um, around the alternative um, transcription start site along the length of the gene um, all the way through the end to the 3' uh, UTR. We're also going to be looking at the function of altered SRADP synthesis. So looking at protein, looking at activity, looking at downstream targets and their function as well as the biology of the system, looking further at cholesterol levels. And then ultimately allowing these neonatal rat pups to grow um, through weaning in adulthood. And unfortunately, at this point in time, we have a 50 to 80 percent mortality for the moms, um, and so it's becoming uh, challenging uh, to actually generate enough neonatal rat pups um, to allow them to grow. Um, partially because they don't seem to be healing their wounds very well, um, and so when we perform the surgery on them, they don't um, close that wound as well. And some of them have sadly eviscerated. And there's a handful of them that never go into labor. Um, they all go to the 25th day of gestation and die. Um, and we have not seen either of these problems with our um, regular diet rats, um, whether they are controls or IEGRs. Um, the other things that we're doing, um, as some of these rats have been able to grow up, um, is looking at glucose tolerance tests to get a sense for insulin resistance as well as MRIs, looking at visceral adiposity. Um, because this is a work in progress, I threw in two quick slides here about what we're actually looking at on MRI. Um, <clears throat> so these are just control males. I don't have MRIs analyzed yet for our IUGR males. But for our control males, um, to orient you to this slide, um, this is actually not the same orientation that you would see a human MRI. And this is of their abdomen. Um, so you can see a kidney right here, just to give you an orientation. The back is on the top of this particular slide, and unlike in humans, the left of the screen is truly the left of the animal, and the right is truly the right. It's just a factor of how they're actually scanned in the small animal imaging facility. We quantify both um, the visceral and the subcutaneous adipose depot. So the visceral depot, we use the retroperitoneal fat, and um, using computer software, we're able to, um, to actually quantify this. Um, as well as the subcutaneous um, fat depots. The four um, pictures on here are the ready slash ready is a prenatal regular diet slash postnatal regular diet. These are all at day 60 um, for the rats that have been able to grow up. So you have the prenatal reg, postnatal reg. Um, the one on the right is a prenatal high fat diet, then postnatal regular diet. Bottom right, prenatal regular, postnatal high. And the last one is high, both, um, high fat diet, both prenatal and postnatal. And um, a little bar graph on the left is just showing that um, the only group that had increased visceral adiposity, again, only among the controls, are those that both moms consume the high-fat diet as well as the rat themselves consume the high-fat diet. And we'll see how that compares um, with our IEGRs as well as in our females.
mothers who had surgery did not gain weight as well as the mothers who didn't have surgery? That's correct. I assume that's the issue of having surgery? Or? Um, pre presumably it's the issue of having surgery. The, it takes 24 to 48 hours um, in other people. We have not looked at this ourselves, but in other people who do similar surgeries on rats. 24 to 48 hours for them to really get full bowel function back. Um, so they probably don't consume as much food after the surgery, um, and that may be playing a role both in being IUGR as well as in um, um, their weight gain. Um, and that's, unfortunately, that's just a fact of the system itself. And that, at one point uh -huh. in uh, gestation, do they get ligated? They're ligated at day 19 and a half of a 21 and a half day gestation. So really their food intake should be picking up the day after the surgery. Um, but it may not fully happen until two days after, which is when we're harvesting them anyway. Um, so I guess you see a, you saw a difference with the um, hepatic cholesterol in uh -huh. the um, treat the treat animals, IVG animals versus uh -huh. just the total serum cholesterol. Why do you think there's a difference, like functionally or what do you think is that? Yeah, that was one of my big questions because it doesn't make a lot of sense. If you think about it, um, we've ligated the mom's arteries, so if anything, they should not be eating very much cholesterol from the mom. The cholesterol doesn't cross the placenta very well. Depending on the study you read, it either doesn't cross at all or doesn't cross in any appreciable amount um, because it's converted into other things and then passed through in different biologic um, agents. But in any case, we've disrupted that process. Um, and so their serum cholesterol levels, I would expect to not necessarily be higher, but then the hepatic cholesterol was certainly higher. Now, and that's why we started looking at the, the genes. Um, and granted, all we have at this point is mRNA, but it's a glimpse into what may actually be happening. Their HMG clay reductase is higher um, in the um, high-fat diet females, um, and they're the group that had statistical, statistical significance in their increase. Um, um, of hepatic cholesterol, and whether or not that is a dysregulated HMG clay reductase, whether it's from upstream factors or epigenetic factors or what exactly it is, I don't know the answer to that yet. That's one of the one of the intriguing questions I have. So thanks for uh, coming, everybody. So uh, I had some suggestions to uh, title this talk the uh, BZ Tea Talk and Boring Zebrafish Talk, but I decided I'd go for something a little more uh, grandiose. So um, I called it the Utah Advanced Therapeutic Therapeutics. And so um, the reason I titled that is because I think uh, the work uh, some of the groups uh, here are doing is going from looking at basic science uh, discoveries, uh, comparing it to stuff we find out in the clinic and with translational studies, and then hopefully actually applying it to therapies that we can use for patients. And so I wanted to kind of highlight uh, three different projects that our group is working on and kind of uh, explain kind of our thought process for how we're trying to tie together these different um, aspects of basic and clinical research. So I thought I'd th start by thanking uh, people, because uh, usually that happens at the end. So I've had uh, great mentorship uh, as I've gone along with uh, Jiben Chen and Frank Van uh, Few. I've had a lot of uh, very talented people working with me, uh, senior level technicians, medical students, undergrads. Um, and so it's been real uh, fun to do this work. Uh, it's, it's been funded, uh, which has been helpful to actually do things. And then we have a couple other projects that I'm not going to talk about today, but that uh, do exist if anyone really cares and wants to talk about it at some point. So um, as we all know, there's uh, various uh, issues facing uh, uh, trying to pursue research in the 21st century. So if you just look at federal funding for research, um, it's actually dropped off in the past five or 10 years, uh, especially noticeable if you actually like uh, control for inflation. 
And at the same time, that's, of course, reflected in how many people get grants. So whether or not you're an established investigator, that's someone on the blue line, or a new investigator, someone on the green line, your overall rates of funding are dropping. So there's big challenges uh, for doing research. So that sounds all kind of doom and gloom. But it, at the same time, it's a really exciting time to be doing research. So um, like one of the really big things that's happening is that uh, we're becoming less, we're operating less and less in the dark when we see patients. And so uh, one of the big technologies that's really driving that right now is the ability to, uh, to find and discover new genes. And one of the big drivers of that is the fact that the cost for doing sequencing has dropped uh, tremendously, much faster than the cost, uh, or much faster than like the advances in biochip, in uh, like uh, computer chip technology. The cost of sequencing is down to less than uh, a couple thousand dollars per human genome. And so I expect that this, even though there's lots of technical and kind of informatic challenges in sequence data, I think this uh, is going to you know, really change our understanding of disease processes. The other thing is that the technologies that we have to use for doing research are much more powerful than you know, five or 10 years ago. And this is like, uh, an example I like a lot. So this is a, a paper that came out uh, about half a year, a year ago in Nature, where these, where these researchers at the University of North Carolina uh, used a um, model of Angelman in mice, and they basically did a large-scale drug screen discovery for, for compounds that would help prevent disease. And they actually found several good candidates for Angelman syndrome. So, you know, we all think of Angelman syndrome as being kind of a developmentally, uh, a developmental uh, disease process, and once you have Angelman syndrome, you never get better. But in fact, what these researchers showed is that um, there's drugs out there that currently are, are available that are FDA approved already that could be used to help treat children with Angelman syndrome. So this is, a, I think, you know, technologies like this are really exciting uh, for all of us for thinking about uh, diseases that affect children. So uh, what I'd like to talk about today is how we kind of combine uh, studies in basic science, uh, understanding mechanisms, and then comparing it to, um, to, to our clinical understanding of patients to, to identify new uh, therapies and treatments. So the first thing I was going to talk about was um, a project we have underway in the lab right now to look at finding new drugs to treat leukodystrophies. And it really involved kind of two components uh, for this project. The first component was looking at um, kind of the clinical impact of leukodystrophies on patients, and the second half has been trying to develop an animal model to discover new drugs to treat patients. So uh, leukodystrophies are diseases of the white matter. Um, they're genetically determined. And um, from work with our own group here at Utah, uh, we were the first people to find out like, what the actual incidence in a population is. So about 1 in 7,000 children um, will develop uh, a leukodystrophy, and of those who but get a leukodystrophy, the um, complication rates are very high. So about a third of the children will die by the time they're eight years old. Another half of them will develop epilepsy. And then they're quite severely uh, developmentally affected. So about half of them are, are uh, ever uh, able to walk. or So half of them can, can never learn, it, learn to walk. So it's a very uh, uh, kind of profound set of diseases that affect these children. And so if you think about, uh, there's many different causes of leukodystrophy, but if you take them as kind of a whole, they have very high health care costs. And so um, some of the patients have very, uh, so we took a, a group of patients and kind of geared uh, kind of children's and in health care and looked at what are the costs that these patients um, get through um, requiring health care. Some of the patients have relatively low costs, um, but the top, out of like 100 patients, so the, of the top 18 patients had super high costs, so about $500,000 per patient over about a seven-year uh, period. So it's just a, a huge health care uh, burden for these patients. And um, when you try and, if you think, okay, well, that's you know, data from here in Utah, how does that compare to data nationally? It's actually quite uh, reflective of what's going on nationally. So we looked at, we looked across, uh, using the FIS database, um, how are patients with leukodystrophy being cared for, how many are being seen, what's the mortality rate, and so, um, the total number of patients seen at different hospitals is determined with little green dots. It's more or less fairly similar at different institutions. But if you look in multiple mortality rates, they're all kind of they're similar. There's no like one place that's really super bad. But how well um, different hospitals care for patients was very different. So for each admission, um, we, we calculated how much were the costs for one patient per admission, basically. So if you had a high efficiency, you had very low cost relatively per admission, whereas if you uh, this, this uh, hospital down here did very poorly in terms of charging each 
admission of a Lucas equation a lot. And so there's a lot of kind, of kind of standard things we could do to improve how well we take care of patients just with current technology of patients with leukodystrophies. So you think, okay, that's great. We can, you know, we can improve kind of care process models. We can do things to take care of patients better. What about actually treating your current patients? So right now, the really the only kind of available treatment for patients with leukodystrophies is something called bone marrow transplantation. And that's only available for a couple of leukodystrophies. So out of about the 30 to 50 causes we know, basically about three or four different leukodystrophies are treated by this, um, by this treatment. And if you walk in off the street and say, I want a bone marrow transplant, just by walking in the door and asking for that, you have a 20% mortality rate. So it's a non-trivial thing to go uh, and get a bone marrow transplantation. And other than uh, bone marrow transplantation, there's no other uh, treatment or cures currently available. So there's a big gap in how we take care of patients and what kind of therapies we can offer for them. So uh, what we've been working on is trying to discover new treatments for leukodystrophies. And really, our, what we've been doing is we've been developing a zebrafish model. And so let me just run through a couple of the reasons why. The first is that they're small and cheap, and so you can look at thousands of animals for relatively low cost. It's a, um, animal, a whole animal model, so it's not cell culture. You're actually looking at the whole organism to understand what the disease does and how the drug affects the whole organism. So I think that's very important because cell culture models are limited by the fact that um, things you discover in a petri dish may have less, may have interactions you're not even appreciating when you look at the whole organism at once. In zebrafish, the lifespan is relatively fast. They develop a nervous system in myelin within three days um, post-realization, so you're not waiting months and months for myelin to develop or for the disease to happen. And the final thing is that, especially in the first few, first week or so of life, they're very small, so you can actually get them into a 96-well plate, which means that you can do all the screening in a high-throughput, or at least uh, what the drug companies call medium-throughput fashion. And so... Uh, we focused on a disease initially called vanishing white matter disease. It's probably one of the top two or three uh, most common leukodystrophies, especially here in the kind of North uh, European Caucasian population. Um, in order to do the screen, we um, made a transgenic uh, zebrafish line in which the myelin the, uh, uh, itself uh, has GFP incorporated in it. So you can actually see the myelin glowing green in the live animal. And so uh, if the myelin's okay, the animal looks green. And so that's uh, this animal right here. And if there's something wrong with the myelin, uh, then you don't see the GFP. And so it's just a simple visual screen to see if the myelin's okay or not. And uh, this disease, we're able to basically induce it to happen just by uh, heat shocking the animals. And so we can see whether or not, you can see the disease happen in the first four days of life. So it's a very fast, easy screen to do, even in undergraduate. So, uh, so uh, in the 96 well format, you have all these zero fish kind of hanging around. They all have the disease. Um, you add a different uh, compound to each well, and then basically a day or two later, you look and say, which of these fish made it? Which of these fish still have myelin? And so the fish that still has myelin, that drug must be doing something to prevent myelin degeneration. And so, uh, so we have the animals for the disease and for the um, to look at the fluorescence. So now we're trying to gear up to do the screen. Uh, so the screens, it depends how many compounds you screen. The more compounds you screen, the higher likelihood that you'll find something that works. Um, there's, a, there's kind of a debate about how many compounds do you need to screen. If you're a drug company and you're testing something in a test tube, they say you want to, tr to test a million compounds. Um, it looks like, I mean, and no one really knows, but they think that if you, the more biological you become, so like going to cell culture and going to like a whole animal, you don't need quite as many compounds because um, the complexity of the animal, uh, if you even find something that works in, an an or in a live animal, it's much more indicative of how well it would work uh, clinically. So we're hoping that something in the thousands to tens of thousands would be the number of animals we need to screen. So that's the, what I was going to talk about for Lucas studies. Uh, so I was going to move on to a new area, uh, studying brain circuits. And so this is an area... Uh, where we've been working on it for several years now, and we're hoping it's really going to take off now. And the technology I'm going to talk about is the technology that, right now, we don't have a clinical use for, it, but on the other hand, um, it has a lot of potential for different uh, kind of prospects, and so I wanted to kind of introduce it to you all. So, uh, what's the holy grail of neurosciences? Oh, not this, but, so if you think about the, the brain, it's a very complex place. There's lots of circuits, they all have to be connected correctly. 
And uh, if, if it's not corrected correctly, like for example, in Tokyo you can't get where you're trying to go in the brain, things don't work correctly if, if it's not hooked up correctly. And so to really understand how the brain functions and what goes wrong when things aren't working right, you need to understand um, how the connectivity works and then what it means uh, kind of for a functional organism. And so what we've been uh, working on is developing technology to uh, make a map of the brain. And so you, with this map, you can hopefully by understanding the connections, you can look at the connections, and you can also then genetically, in a genetically defined fashion, uh, control or disrupt them to understand how the brain's working. So there's current technologies that exist for looking at brain circuits, and they all have various limitations. So um, you can do fixing of, of tissue, which of course kills the animal, uh, but it gives you the best resolution, but you can't really understand in what the nervous system is doing because you've killed it. There's various genetic tracers uh, that exist, but they only show one single neuron at a time. So you can kind of see that neuron, but you can't see who its partners are, how it's functioning. And then uh, in the past 10 years, viral tracers have become very popular, some stuff like rabies virus. So there's various problems with working with rabies virus, like you could die. But then other problems that the rabies virus itself, uh, even when they kind of attenuate it, it's still a fairly toxic to neurons. There's about a week or two where the uh, researchers can work with the rabies virus. And um, you can't genetically control where you're putting the virus. So you can't really, you don't know which group of neurons you're looking at at any time. And so we've been trying to develop a, a genetic method for looking at neurons that connect to each other. So we want it to be robust, genetic, and we wanted to come up with a cool name. So kind of two different goals. So um, our name was uh, TCAT, or Transcellular Activation of Transcription. Now, you'll see why in a second we called it that. So basically the idea is we want to be able to look at neurons when they contact each other. To do that, we want the two neurons to uh, basically light up when they come into contact. So we're using kind of a complex um, ligand receptor system where you have one neuron that expresses the ligand and the other expresses this receptor. And when they come into contact, a cleavage event occurs and it releases a... Um, a transcription factor that turns on transcription in that second cell. So uh, when, that second transcri when that transcription factor gets released to turn on transcription, then suddenly you can turn on like GFP, you can turn on um, whatever, whatever thing you want in that second cell. So you can, you can use it to visualize the cell, you can use it to manipulate what the neuron does. Um, <clears throat> and so it gives you kind of this uh, power to look at uh, neurons that come into contact with each other. So it's, it's the neurons that make contact in which you'd see the labeling between the two different cells. So um, we've done this now uh, in a bunch of different tissue types in kind of a non-regulated fashion. So these are just some examples in the eye, and this is the muscles. And so the, when the two cells come into contact, they turn on GFP, or the green fluorescent protein in the second cell. And so what we're uh, working on using it right now for is to understand uh, circuits in the brain. To, to map them and to understand how those maps um, get formed, and as well to understand what those maps, what those groups of circuits are doing. Uh, we have, of course, our interest is in the nervous system, but the same kind of things are going on in other parts of the body, for example, cardiac morphogenesis, um, development of the immune system, where the groups of cells come into contact with each other, like uh, immune honing to the uh, spleen. So we think this could have wide um, use in a lot of different kind of uh, studies of developmental processes. And then uh, we've all designed it for use, um, uh, you know, in a, in a model system, but could we use the same kind of things to, do, to design uh, site-specific therapies in a human? And so I think this is something in the future that we want to explore. So this is the last uh, part of the talk. And so again, it, this, this work actually started out uh, in zebrafish, and then now it's gone over to look at stuff in people. So this is a map of uh, premature births in the world. So red is the worst, yellow is kind of in between, and green is not as bad, um, and then Greenland has no data. So, uh, so if you're red, then your rate of prematurity is 15%. If you're uh, yellow, then your rate is between 10 and 15%. If you're green, it's less than 10%. And so the United States is one of the uh, top 10 countries uh, in rates of premature birth. So as we all know, premature birth has a lot of complications. So um, about, in the United States, about 12% of all births are premature, and that worldwide this amounts to 13 uh, million births a year. So it's a huge you know, issue that we all see and deal with. 
uh, deal with. So uh, depending how premature, how prematurely you're born, the more prematurely uh, you're born, the higher your rates of neurocognitive adverse outcomes. And so, for example, in very low birth rate infants, those rates approach about 35%. And it, the kind of neurocognitive um, problems they have are quite uh, variable. So they can range from things like autism spectrum disorders, epilepsy, ADHD, intellectual disability, kind of weird, broad spectrum of different neurocognitive problems. So essentially, if you're born premature, there's nothing that we're currently doing that helps prevent this uh, risk. So uh, this idea came to us, we're thinking, well, uh, during uh, human gestation when you're born, lots of uh, important aspects of connections are, getting, are occurring during this period between 24 and 40 weeks gestation, so this kind of prime risk period for being born premature. And so and during this time period, uh, there's uh, fairly high rates of uh, kind of chronic low-level hypoxia uh, that infants are exposed to. So our question was, is hypoxia itself, just hypoxia, not hypoxic ischemia, but just hypoxia affecting how connections form the central nervous system. So we used a zebrafish model to look at this because we have much more uh, powerful tools for looking at connections of the axons and the synapses. And uh, we actually demonstrated that uh, different groups of neurons, in this case, this is a group of neurons uh, crossing their axons in the midline here. If you expose them to hypoxia, they fail to form this midline uh, set of connections. And so again, it's not that the neurons are dying or that there's massive destruction, is that the axons are making a bad choice and not crossing to where they're supposed to be going. So uh, when this happens, uh, we can see a regulation of various markers of hypoxia in the animal. Uh, we can also chemically reproduce it. So there's various chemicals that, that uh, induce the hypoxia pathway. So for example, there's a compound called DMOG, DMOG which uh, basically can cause an animal to think it's hypoxic even though it's not. And so you can uh, replicate uh, these hypoxia effects using a chemical mimic. So it's shown that this hypoxia effect that we see is actually due to this thing called the hypoxia musical factor pathway. So it's kind of this replicable, um, clear cut effects of hypoxia on the axon pathfinder. So we thought, well, you know, let's kind of see what we can do. And so one of the things we checked was would magnesium have any effects on protecting the animals on, from hypoxia? So basically, we incubate the animals with magnesium. At the same time, we expose them to hypoxia, which actually rescue or help prevent the axon pathfinding defects. So the higher the dose of magnesium, the basically the lower the rates of the um, of uh, the axon pathfinding errors. Uh, we we saw a down regulation of markers of hypoxia in the animals. So this is hypoxia. This is an animal where we've incubated it with magnesium. And again, if we um, with the, even with the chemical inducer hypoxia, magnesium could also rescue the defects uh, caused by the by the chemical inducer of hypoxia. Did. did it rest with it or prevent it? Well, so we did try timing to see if we could do it first and then do it after. We basically co-incubated the animal at the time of hypoxia with the, with the magnesium. Is that kind of answer your question? I was wondering, if you already got the hypoxic event and you already have the connections not being made and you add magnesium back, do you regrow these uh, connections? No, so we didn't, we didn't test that, but I mean, what we think is happening is that when hypoxia occurs, the axons are going down to kind of a choice point. So as, as axons grow, they, they encounter choice points. And if you, if you get to the choice point during while you're hypoxic, you make a bad choice and go up to another pathway. Once you've gone down the other pathway, you don't come back and go back to where you're supposed to go. So the reason I looked at magnesium, I thought we should look at magnesium, is because there's this data in the perinat uh, perinatology literature that if you're an expectant mother uh, with an infant who's about to be born premature, that you should be given magnesium prior to birth. And the reason for that is that there's a, a series of data, which is kind of summarized here, showing that uh, magnesium supplementation prior to a preterm birth uh, somewhat lowers the rates, the risk of cerebral palsy. So this is uh, odds ratios, I think. Uh, so this is one with no effect, and then most of the data kind of falls over to the left magnesium having kind of a protective effect for cerebral palsy. And so this is a single, well, it's basically giving a prima, it's giving the mother magnesium um, to, which then somehow is affecting the um, fetus and the infant's risk for developing uh, cerebral palsy. So then the question I had, kind of based on our own data and seeing this data about cerebral palsy, was that would uh, magnesium supplementation in premature infants 
help reduce neurologic, long-term neurologic complications in the infants. So obviously, there's, you, know, you can't just go in and start giving uh, babies magnesium, at least. I think the NIC would be too excited about that. So um, as kind of a backdoor approach to looking at this question, we said, well, are there some infants who just happen to run higher or lower than magnesium levels? And would that, cor would that correlate with how they do neurologically? And so what we did is we basically looked at a convenient sample of 79 infants where we knew what their outcomes were. So these are premature infants, and we had their outcomes. We had the magnesium levels. We said, let's take a look at this and see what it looks like. So 79 infants, they're all less than 1,200 grams, less than 27 weeks gestation. And we had follow-up for up to five years after birth using the HELP-2 and EDW, so long-term follow-up. And then these are just kind of the demographics, a little over half are male. In the long-term, 13% developed epilepsy, 33% had an abnormal uh, motor exam. And the abnormal motor exam was followed at the state health clinic, uh, the neonatal follow-up clinic. Because and actually getting that data is non-trivial. Uh, I'll just point out. So you know, only some of the infants in NICUs actually get seen at the state health department or state health uh, clinic, and you know records are in place, so it's just kind of a hassle to get that data. But it's really important for understanding what's going on. So uh, so this is where you kind of have to think. Okay, how, how are you going to understand what's going on? So the first is um, Jacob Wilkes and Xiaoming Sheng did basically a basic logistic regression analysis, but they tried to control for some of the biggest potential confounders for what else could be affecting how these infants do. So they, they controlled for, um, for other aspects like birth weight and gender, and they found that um, if you get a higher magnesium, then your odds risk for developing epilepsy was lower, and that was significant. Same thing with the abnormal motor exam. The higher your magnesium levels in infant, the lower your risk for having an abnormal motor exam. So abnormal motor exam, like hypotonia, Cerebral palsy, spasticity, were kind of our definitions of abnormal motor exam. Hey, did you just have a question? When was the magnesium taken? So they weren't getting any extra magnesium. These are just infants. So I mean, when was the level? Okay. So the levels are random. So we have, this is all a convenient sample. We have no kind of control over whether it's day, on day one of the baby's life or day 13. Just kind of random magnesium levels. So it's, it's from their NICU states. It could be any time during the But only but during the NICU states. Yeah. yeah. So the problem with this approach, with doing logistic regression analysis, because our numbers are so small that uh, it makes statisticians unhappy. You don't want to make statisticians unhappy. So um, the alternative is to do a um, t-test, basically saying average magnesium level versus your outcome of interest, uh, and not controlling those different factors. Because once you start controlling for factors, you need more N, which we just didn't have for this pilot study. And so if you look at epilepsy, just using a, a straightforward t-test, then um, the, the risk is lower, but it doesn't reach a statistical significance of 0.08 for epilepsy. A normal motor exam is still statistically significant with a P of 0 0.034. So there's, um, so probably this is probably more statistically correct than what we'll probably go with for publishing, but we're, we're reassured by kind of seeing how it falls out with doing a logistic regression analysis. So um, because the big, um, so there's various problems with this study, right? It's a small study, small n. Uh, we don't have any control over when the values were. Um, and so what we're doing is we're trying to do a much larger study where we have thousands of infants for a longer time period. Now, the advantage of the study is we'll have a lot bigger n. The disadvantage is we won't have um, the clinical outcome of abnormal motor exam because not all these infants will be followed up in state health department clinics. So we may have to use proxies in our database searches like where they're getting Botox injections or heel cord releases or stuff like that. So on the one hand, we'll have more power because it'll be a much bigger data set, but we'll also lose some of the detail that we want for this. And so I, mean, I think we have to go through this step before we even consider something like an intervention study. So if this looked promising, then we could think about would um, keeping magnesium bit levels higher in babies, premature babies, would that help with long-term neurologic outcomes? So just to wrap things up, so I think there's really big opportunities, even despite the kind of uh, somewhat dismal funding climate, to um, take you know, things we're discovering in lab and to then look at what can you do with therapies. Uh, and hopefully with some of the stuff you've seen today makes you think, yeah, that is possible. And I think a big power is that we have, we have the ability in Utah to go from finds in the lab and to translate that using all this clinical and genetic uh, power that's been built up here. 
Thanks for everyone's attention. I'd be happy to take any questions.